sehr geehrte Damen. Ladies and Gentlemen. Werte Vortragende. Uh, dear speakers. Ich begrüße Sie. Herr. I would like to cordially welcome you to the Daylight by Euro Window Conference as part of Glass Tech 2022. My name is Verena Oberauch, and as a president of Euro Window, I will be your host. Euro Window is a non for profit uh, organization headquartered in Brussels and a secretariat in Brussels. There are 19 uh, national associations from 14 European countries and one company farming members because uh, participation in Euro Window is also open to companies. Euro Window represents the interests of the European window and fenestration um, sectors and with related stakeholders. Uh, what uh, is your window working on? Well, let me briefly provide you with an overview of the main activities of your window. It is, of course, energy efficiency topic, energy efficiency, and of course, increasingly um, CE certification and standards uh, that are so important for harmonized market in the EU. All papers and information can be found on our website, eurowindow.eu. Um, yeah. Well, apart from our work on uh, directives and regulations of the European Union, Euro Window, of course, also has a brief for research and training. And this is why this conference is taking place today. Um, windows and construction, how does this go together? Well, windows actually perform lots of tasks, as this graphic shows. Large windows permit uh, solar gain. This is important not only to bring down heating costs, but also also for sunlight and daylight entering the building. Plenty of daylight limits your need for artificial lighting during the day. Good ventilation lowers the temperature during the night. And of course, uh, natural ventilation also improves indoor air quality. Intelligent automation is needed to, to achieve full benefits of windows and Last but not least, good um, solar protection glass uh, protect uh, indoor rooms from overheating. As you can see, windows um, cannot only be reduced to energy savings. European standards and directives increasingly um, cover the various uh, uses of windows, such as the Daylight Standard EN 17037, published in 2019. Another example is a new draft for building directives. Uh, now, I would like to briefly introduce you to today's speakers. All of them uh, are daylight experts with uh, different accesses to this topic. First, we will be hearing Leif Daniel Haug of the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. He is an architect, um, uh, studied in Toronto and Berlin, and um, works with uh, Kirsten Jagmund and Spinnagen at the University of Life Sciences in Norway. He heads the Institute for Construction Engineering and Sustainable Technology. He intensively deals with daylight planning, above all in school buildings, but also beyond. Our second speaker today is Professor uh, Engineer Peter Andres, an Austrian engineer, a lighting designer, and uh, a professor for light planning. He has an office uh, in Hamburg since uh, 86, but also based in Tyrol, and teaches at the Bären Bären School uh, at the Un Dusseldorf University and at the Free uh, Academy of the Arts in Hamburg. He is an award-winning light planner and architect uh, for the Balthasar Neumann Award and the Lighting Designer of the Year. So he received this award in 2012 and 2016. Then we will be addressed by architect uh, Louis uh, Lars Courage of uh, Courage Architects in Appledon, Holland, an award winning architect from the TU Delft. And he worked at Octo Tube and ZBZ and now heads together with his wife since 2001 the Courage Architects office. He, too, 
is an award-winning architect uh, by the Steel Construction Award, the Dutch Steelite Award was given to him, and he also teaches at the Technical University of Delft and heads the Institute, Dutch Institute for Daylight. Finally, uh, we will be addressed by Mrs. Nelly Filipona, who is a major expert in glass production and dealing with uh, glass products and daylight uh, management. She is active at UFME, but also at SECA and Glass for Europe organizations. She is involved in the development of the RD 2012 and of the new RE 2020 in France. And today she will talk about the latest developments in uh, French legislation about daylight. Before we, Before we actually uh, get going, um, I would briefly like to mention our sponsors and thank them who made this uh, conference possible, Aluplast. This is a systems provider based near um, Karlst, uh, Karlsruhe Finstra, um, a window manufacturer Saint-Gobain, active, uh, actively uh, established in 53. So Munchal Fest glasses are produced by the solar industry and for the automotive industry. And last but not least, Velux, the roof window producer from Denmark, who has been providing solutions for tilted uh, roofs, pitched roofs, and flat roofs for over 80 years now. Well, uh, so look forward to the answers provided by the speakers to the questions, why is daylight in buildings so important? Why do we need daylight in our buildings? Why should we deal uh, with this uh, in uh, directives and regulations specifying values, set values for daylight uh, supply in uh, buildings? Why it is so difficult to regulate daylight needs and buildings and last not least the big question how will the buildings of the future look like will it be lighter or are we going back to the cave and with this i would like to hand the floor to our first speaker uh, live hawk a brief uh, word for the speakers please stick to your time slot i will actually give you little pointers five minutes to the end this is the yellow card and one minute left means a yellow card for you so, lots of success. Guten Tag. Well, good afternoon. My name is Leif, My name is Leif Hauk. In, uh, on the I work at the Oslo. university, uh, the city of Oz, near Oslo. We, um, I will be speaking German, and this is not my native tongue, and this is why I will probably um, um, have to stop uh, time and again. I will be speaking about daylight and humans. Why do we need daylight? I love daylight, but this is not enough for planning to, to use this as an argument. We're not made for sitting in an office or in such a hall. Uh, for thousands of years, we've been developing to be in the outdoors, uh, around the equator, exposed to the sun, not that far north. And we receive lots of energy from the sun. As an architect, it is inconceivable to work with architecture without working with light, either if it's uh, whether it's up lights or maybe a workshop uh, that you can see well enough or get inspirations. Or in Norway, for instance, uh, we love to go up high mountaineering in nature. We are looking for the sun, we're looking for nature, and windows establish a connection between us and nature. My son said, Dad, uh, when I'm sad at school, then I look outside the window. And this is uh, a, a general need that we need windows. In a swimming pool, it is so boring to swim back and forth, but it makes so much more sense when you see uh, the sunlight changing, the sky, the nature as it floats by. These women set 
Nicht im Down in the sun, not in the shade. They're enjoying the vistas and spend lots of time. And I can understand them. When uh, um, talking about science, it is not that easy. We know that people are prepared to pay more for a stateroom on a cruise ship with a window. But in schools, um, people ask, is it worthwhile to have more windows or not? Yes, research shows that uh, your brain capacity improves when you have access to lots of light. Uh, Lisa Fischer showed that um, when you do telephone selling, those with lots of access to light simply sell more than those who have less access to light. And in, in hospitals, uh, those with access to daylight, the patients recover more quickly. I can unfortunately not show it, but uh, workers are more productive. And as it says here, 15 to 40 percent increase in retail sales. This is what science showed, um, the science that also looked at the, uh, the core science of it. The test scores. This is really striking. When you have daylight like here, then people sell more, shoppers buy more. Research is difficult. It is not as easy as shown here. When you read the research findings, let me just give you one example to make you understand. If you're interested, um, uh, I would recommend Lisa Strong because she has uh, really done lots of broad-based uh, research, very credible, because it's not enough to measure daylight and how much you sell or retail. There may be a thousand other reasons why those selling near the window sell more than the others. Maybe it's the better ones that have actually occupied or won over the best places. Lisa Strong, in her study, looked at uh, 30, 35 parameters at the same time. Das ist sehr, sehr and uh, this is, is, is very cumbersome and, and uh, uh, labor intensive. As you can see um, in the left hand side, uh, excellent vistas and um, until you move the way back behind partition walls. And she used this term of break view. When I work, I don't see anything. But when I turn around with my chair, then I will see daylight and I will see a window. This really helps a lot already. Dann verkaufen die schneller. So they sell faster and better. And uh, she looked at uh, call center agents um, because their jobs are so similar uh, to make things measurable uh, compared to architects, for instance. Um, who is more efficient as an architect, uh, those working with daylight or those without daylight? This is impossible to measure. Also, we, sind Wesen. we are um, uh, human beings, we're creatures that work on a circadian rhythm of 24 hours. Although it is, uh, even if it was completely dark, we would stick to this rhythm. By definition, it's plus minus four hours, but in general, uh, human beings uh, uh, share this rhythm with many uh, plants and bacteria, this circadian rhythm. And this is controlled uh, by, amongst others, melatonin and serotonin. And daylight is what, when you get up in the morning and um, you get daylight, um, then the body uh, starts to produce a cocktail of hormones that you need. So daylight uh, uh, has an important effect, biological effect that it produces. 
Serotonin. Serotonin, for instance, establishes the link between the brains and, and the rest of our body. Quite important. There's also a strong correlation between being happy and uh, serotonin levels. Um, the latest research shows that uh, when you um, opt for lots of daylight, that this also produces a very strong effect. Durch Tageslicht Through daylight, uh, so uh, melatonin is uh, suppressed, so you really wake up, and the more daylight you get during the day, the, the more melatonin is being produced at night, and we need melatonin to be able to sleep. And if you don't sleep well, then there is a lot of other problems associated with it. Everything gets more difficult, not social matters, but many diseases. Um, um, occur when you lack sleep, also hunger, the appetite, uh, these are other hormones, but also they are controlled by the circadian rhythm. Um, in the eye, we have uh, uh, various receptors. You probably know this from school. We have receptors for daylight with colors, and um, if it decreases, then we have more black and white receptors. So th there's more blue light here, and what is pretty recent in research is that uh, humans also have receptors for non-visible light. So 10% of totally blind uh, people still have these intact receptors, and they can actually sit in the daylight, and uh, they can then thereby improve their sleep rhythm. Das Tageslicht ist nicht Daylight is not constant across the day. The sun gets up and it is uh, reddish, and uh, in the course of the day, um, the content of the daylight changes. When we Comparing this with electrical artificial light, on the right hand side, we'll see, uh, on the left side, you will see sunlight, which has a lot of blue in it and a huge long wavelength spectrum, whereas other artificial light sources do not provide such a wide spectrum. There are, uh, there is electrical light available, artificial light that is more similar to sunlight, and this is currently being developed, but I will not cover this topic now. I'll instead show you some examples. A new uh, college erected in Oslo, Fernanda Nissen School. Left of this is a cafeteria. So when school's over, the students receive a, a hot meal, but there's not enough seating available. And this is why the idea was for students to also use these wooden staircases. And now the students arrive and they first sit next to the window. Obviously, the idea was not to sit only along the window, because it's even more difficult. But these are the first seats taken. Only when all of these window seats are taken, the students actually move towards the center of the staircase. In the 20s and 30s, we had tuberculosis, and um, people thought that light and fresh air would be the best uh, solution against TB and uh, TBC. And they, they built uh, colleges and, and hospitals uh, that were designed to create lots of air and, and daylight. I like these examples. This uh, open Lucht school in Holland, the classrooms are glazed from four sides, and they even share a terrace with another class. Room. This is unfortunately no longer possible. What is the status quo? Well, we plan more 
And I'm going to show you what the situation is like in Norway. We have to build more environmentally friendly. We have to be more energy efficient. And this is why there is a higher pressure to build compact buildings. I have this mass of 24 rooms. And in former times, uh, you would have used the bottom version where all of the rooms get daylight. Now. There's so much pressure on planners that you build uh, the top version. Does a meeting room have to have natural daylight? Uh, can't you have classrooms that you don't use all day round uh, that can do without daylight? But what is more environment friendly? What is more sustainable? Here you can see two schools. It's the same building specifier, but it, there's a difference of 10 years between the schools. One is the Gilskoggen School uh, to the left. All classrooms have, uh, are square, have uh, uh, two uh, window fronts, all group rooms have daylight, the uh, rooms in between that are shared, like kitchens and seating, everything has daylight. Ten years later, the Marienlust School is erected. And they thought, well, how much area can I steal from the classrooms and um, create alternative uh, um, teaching areas without touching the facade? And some classrooms are, are square. Uh, uh, some have daylight uh, and the long side, um, others have only the small side exposed to daylight. I um, refer to this as the turned around classrooms. And when you measure how much facade meters, how many facade meters, uh, where uh, students actually spend 80 or 90 percent of their time, how many running meters of facade the school has? The old one had 14 meters of facade per class. This was normal. The new um, passive uh, house school only has 9.4 meters of facade per class. So how does this go from here? This is the Hag School, the old school to the left. You can see the long uh, building, uh, big dif distances, and lots of light for all of the rooms. Then the school uh, uh, is old, the new school was introduced. It's this the same plot. Um, the old school was demolished and replaced by this more compact version. And as you can see at the bottom, uh, it only has 6.2 meters of facade per class. So all classrooms are very, very deep. Um, and there is no facade opening for the uh, group rooms or for the shared areas and even the teacher teaching there actually uh, either has to turn right or left to to see his pupils he will never be able to see all pupils at the same time i did a, um, a research um, uh, for competitions, school competitions, and I found that in uh, eight out of 10 cases, uh, the school is the winner that actually has uh, the lowest amount of meters of facade per class. Other examples, this is the uh, facade refurbishment. Lots of glass in the 70s, hardly any glass in 2012. And this Weyerwang school complies with the new legislation, and this says 2% uh, of the daylight factor, and I'll explain this a little later. But we only have 0.24. I was involved in such a competition as an advisor and as a jury member. And we said in the briefing that the 
school should have 12 running meters of facade per classroom. And all um, contestants had to offer it. And nevertheless, they all complied with the passive house standard. And this is why we knew, regardless of how we rearrange the rooms in this concept, we have enough facade available. The building remains flexible, and the students will get daylight in the shared rooms and in the group rooms. I will now describe how you handle daylight um, in general. There are uh, different theoretical, say, skies, sky models, I think across Europe. Um, we most mostly use the overcast sky. This is a model without sun. And um, it's a static sky model. So the directions of, of the sky are not uh, considered. So local climate findings are not considered. The orientation of the building is not uh, considered, nor solar protection. That's let down. This is the Nordic building code, so to speak, that um, the Himmel immer daylight is uh, handled or managed as if there was always an overcast sky. But in reality, das Klima unterschiedlich. climate uh, Climates differ, and this graph shows how much blue sky we have in Oslo, Paris, and Rome. In Rome, you have lots of clear skies, and in Paris and Oslo, you don't have so many days. And um, to the extreme right, you can see the overcast amount of overcast days. Rome does fine in the statistics. Oslo has lots of it. And let me tell you, Oslo and southern Norway uh, is uh, the region where we get most sunshine. So if you picked a city in the north of Norway, these figures uh, would uh, even be different. So the calculation models that we apply today only consider the outer geometry of building complexes. We simply cannot say uh, uh, anything about the daylight potential. If we consider the geographical situation, the climate data, the orientation of the building, um, if we factor these in, which is possible to do now, it would look like this. So different directions would actually fare differently. So there's more blue than in the previous picture. This means the more precise we calculate this, um, it, it's not worthwhile. The, the results are even worse. But this is more in line with reality, and this is why it, uh, it, it should pay off to actually make this comparison. This is also what we calculated uh, to see uh, whether how big the potential photovoltaics would be. We also built a school where we were informed that the windows have to become smaller because uh, uh, we need to produce more electricity via these facade. And I think that this is, this is nonsensical. If you're not familiar with these terms, DA, um, daylight autonomy. This is when you actually factor in climate data and the building orientation. Then DA is the amount, or this is this is the number of uh, hours of sufficient daylight available. Then there is the UDI, the useful daylight illuminance. And even if daylight is not sufficient, um, it makes a major contribution. If it is more than 100 lux, then it is a good contribution. And then it is also included in the model. If there is too much daylight, so then this is not good. And uh, what we also 
have to uh, take into consideration is uh, glare. In this uh, study, we had categories one to six of the classrooms. Uh, six would be a classroom with daylight from two uh, sides. The theory behind this is uh, that there is glare uh, causing problem. So the best results in maths uh, are obtained in classrooms with uh, up lights, with, um, with skylights, sorry, with skylights. So when you have Claire, you can't be very good in mathematics. Since our computers uh, are more performant, uh, we will have better and smarter algorithms and th that need less time to calculate matters. And this is why we will soon be able to um, build in all of the uh, um, uh, work out daylight-based climate metrics and also factoring in solar protection systems. And then this should be introduced in, uh, to the building codes, the legislation. So uh, if we do not include the building orientation and the climate factors, then we end up with projects like this, the Telenor, the Stat Oil Building in Oslo. And as we can see, whether you like it or not, the windows uh, are the same wherever they are. This is just a concept. It doesn't correlate to the surroundings. And then there is an example from Oslo Barcode. Here, it was precisely calculated how much sunlight really hits from where, and the window sizes were designed accordingly. Even if we uh, plan and design buildings by computer and uh, uh, produce windows digitally, um, it still remains a problem to produce uh, many window sizes. It has become easier to actually produce various uh, types of uh, uh, windows. I did not receive a yellow card nor a red card, but this is my last chart. Um, we need a light. How much daylight we need? Well, the latest thing I read was um, you have to have 300 lux for at least one hour to uh, obtain optimum melatonin uh, suppression and afterwards in the evening to obtain optimum melatonin production. So this is the latest research I read. I think there are two paths. Um, there is the simple path. Um, I work with schools and for me, the running facade meter per classroom um, on a conceptually, uh, conceptual level is very important. For many projects, you have to make a clear statement to be able to compare concepts. And then the second part, the other path is more complex when we look at details. Is and that is that important rooms or critical rooms are calculated very precisely to factor for climate, sun direction, solar protection, and to all really factor it in when we plan a building. Thank you. Haben Sie mein Deutsch verstanden? Wunderbar. <laughs> Did you understand my German? <laughs> I would like to thank you for this very exciting insight you provided us with into daylight and our health and into the wonderful examples from the school practice in Norway. Are there questions for Mr. Hauk from the audience? Yes, please. Mike is coming. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, yeah. I do have a question about your calculation. Do you find? Did you find actually a um, a software able to calculate a, in an accurate way the reputation of lights because you showed two different um, graphics? So did you find something that is actually accurate and find the results a good result? Yes, uh, I, I had some. I chose not to show it, but we have different programs that we use. Um, I th think we like to use Rhino and, and uh, applications that we put into Rhino, uh, but different. Uh, but it's uh, what I maybe didn't. I am an architect. And I do some s simple calculations, but the more complex calculations my uh, colleague is doing. So, um, please. Um, hi. Uh, could you um, explain the regulation in Norway uh, about uh, daylight uh, in buildings, uh, if it's simple? And uh, what uh, if there is any um, uh, prospect of uh, adopting the new EN standard? So the problem in Norway is that the law is it should have sufficient daylight, and then there are the like the building code, the requirements. What does this mean? So it ha has this expression in rooms with permanent where people are permanent there should be two pr there should be s daylight and then there is explanation what is that and that's two percent daylight factor and then you are allowed to use the useful or no, daylight autonomy thing it's just that every time you use that you get it gets worse so you want to use the simple one uh, because then you can make a worse apartment uh, cheaper. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we, we try to put this on the agenda. But I think it's it's not it's something beautiful with a building code that is simple and everyone can handle it. Um, so the, the easier it is to use the tools the more likely it is that we can improve this. Mm. Yes, do we have, uh, gibt es weitere Fragen aus dem Publikum? Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I think that's fine. Dann bedanke ich mich. Yeah. Und, uh, well, thank you in that particular case. And I would like to ask Professor Andreas to join me on stage. <laughs> So, good Okay, uh, hello from me, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You can understand me. That's good, great. 
Ja, vielen Dank. So, thank you very much uh, uh, for my uh, predecessor speaker. Um, he already mentioned uh, a lot of things uh, where we completely agree. Uh, I mean, uh, since I've been the older one, I've been working for 36 years. I've been doing this on my own. We're six together, and we come from different disciplines, from electric technology, from design, from uh, building design, in interior architecture, lighting design. It's a bit more complicated complicated to plan light. Today is 36 years or, or more than 40 years ago when I started. It was, things were more simple. Of course, so we, part, we don't do this on our own. So we have a few more ladies on our team. That happens also very often these days. So now we not only try to plan light theoretically, but to try this out straight away. And therefore, our offices are light laboratories, and the core of our light laboratory is an artificial sky. And we need this artificial sky to calculate daylight, and that's what we do, but it's always important that we also feel daylight. Uh, with simple uh, models, uh, if I have a variant, and if I change the glass, if I take a look inside, I can feel the quality of light. And we have to think that our light sense is, is 480 million years old. Our highly developed lens in our eyes are also three and a half million years old. And we exclusively developed this system at one quality, and that's daylight um, at some point in time. Fire was added, but this was all about daylight. That is, so we can uh, simulate all sorts of uh, uh, sky scenarios and also uh, every daylight at any point in the world. Uh, uh, architects like, like planning glass facades. You have to be able to look inside. It has to be transparent. So let me carry on here. Those are the usual pictures, uh, and uh, we get as architects and as planners, we get this, this, it has to be transparent, this is about the university. And we take one look and say, it cannot work, although the architect would like it this way. When we have our friends from the technical, overall technical planning, and uh, there are uh, regulations, uh, this reflection that you're here to, it mustn't heat up. The warmth from inside must not um, be transferred to the outside. And to put all this together, uh, you need uh, uh, such uh, live testing that with the right glass, we can try it out, and with the normal uh, light, uh, Bremen, how much light do I need inside so it looks nice and transparent? At the bottom left, yes, everybody wants it, but you say these are 8,000 lux, that is per square meter, per square meter wall uh, area. You need more, much more lighting than uh, lux than you need for the school lighting who uh, just has to use uh, seven watts instead of our 100 watts. So it looks transparent and it's important that you talk, that you discuss this. In, at an early point in time, the house technology planner, how can I get the energy out? The other one doesn't want to want to rooms to heat up. It's possible and it's important and it's indispensable to discuss this. At an early point in time, of course, this is for, for Bremen and Hamburg. Of course, it looks different at the North Cape and in Rome or Hamburg. This is just to add something to what my colleague said about the sky. The left, the sky on the left, you see this example. It's, 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 um, so the lighting is uh, relatively uh, similar. And at the bottom, you see the sun, where the sky is lighter. Well, it's, it's uh, easy to calculate when there is a, an even diffusion, but there are clouds, and so it's important if you take a closer look in more detail and use the bottom model. And it's important where the window is located, the same yeah. window area in square meters where it's positioned that has different uh, results. You have to know where do I uh, install the window. That brings some different qualities of the feeling. That was a um, uh, competition that we look the stage for the Dortmund University. And on the right, you see an old house from the 50s. Uh, of course, uh, windows were implemented there. And on the left, we had a new building. And it's uh, 
uh, clear that the, the design one which uh, uh, provided most daylight, and that's the old house. And I like sitting there on the top, and it's incredible when you sit here, you look outside, and you have the feeling that it's brighter inside than outside. And this quality, you have to believe this, but you have to, you have to feel this. Uh, you have to experience this quality. Of course, there's solar protection everywhere. Of course, it would heat up in Hamburg too. But the owners uh, did something like this. They have a monitor, a screen on the right, and uh, it is recorded when things have to be shaded or not. And uh, uh, so, some fami families uh, um, were supposed to l live there uh, for, for test reasons. And, and it was a good uh, example. And uh, the, the area wasn't that nice, but the, the family, they bought this house because they didn't know where the light switch was. Because it's a bright house with a lot of light that also fulfills all lighting requirements and regulations. Sometimes we have the problem that we have provide not to provide too much light. That's a Kaspar David Friedrich uh, painting there on the left, um, which mustn't be lit so much. And um, what applies to Hamburg or Dusseldorf, we have a very irregular daylight potential. That in, in winter, we have much less daylight than in the summer. So if it's just sufficient in the summer, and we don't overheat, in when, and we have not enough light. So if I can do without artificial light in the winter, I have a heat problem in the summer. So to get a proper trade-off for this, uh, we set screens for the uh, skylights, and, and, and just by uh, shading, uh, shading the down, pulling down the screen, you can adjust this over the entire year, so you have a bright room. And uh, the architect 100 years ago planned this for daylight. So we wanted to retain this character, but that the builders and the builder owners' uh, requirements were fulfilled. Apart from the light intensity, we, call, we have something that's called character of light. That is extremely uh, directed light. It, it, it won't be difficult to do this inside, but we don't want this either. So the, the light, independent of the, 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 the portions that you need, the proportions that you need that I stay awake, I have to create light that when I enter, it reminds me of good weather. That, that doesn't really uh, imply so in, in Addis Ababa. They don't listen when we talk about this, but we're not in Ethiopia here. We are in middle Europe. And it's, it's fun, especially in the dark seasons. That light reminds you of good weather, ideally when it's raining and you forget your umbrella. And with you have artificial light that fulfills your requirements, the healthy, healthy requirements. But also, it, it's fun to look at. And that, that triggers us, uh, that's, as we call this today. Hamburg Airport is clear. We didn't want to have so much light there. We could have had glass everywhere. Then it would have been bright also in the winter, but horrible in the summer. Uh, uh, on the other hand, that it would be sufficient in summer, that what didn't apply either. So we had a middle uh, value of 5.6 daylight percentage, and we want to lift it, we want to experience. Also, oh, I forgot my ticket, I have to open my case. I don't have to leave the, the, the room. I experience this inside, and I can look for, look for my ticket inside, and that's what we mean by light quality. It's not about the intensity only, but also to, uh, that you perceive this good weather inside. So now that, that's a picture, we turn this around. That's one of the few pictures where you can save artificial life, uh, where, uh, where you take daylight away. That's not very up to date because you have to wait three or four hours until your suitcase arrives today. But if you only wait 15 minutes, you don't need enough more light and you take all the daylight. And if a, a glass windows there with a transmission of 80 percent, I can light 80 or five, 50 meters, but not 400 meters. And now if, if I have a glass this down to 10 percent, but with a good color rendering, the, 
is less glare for your eyes, and I do not have to have so much artificial uh, light inside and have the same impression of uh, uh, the light, lightness and illuminance. So at some point, uh, Lufthansa came and uh, said, uh, if the, the sun is on our, our ticket booth, then uh, we can mm, uh, pull down a screen, solar protection, and the ladies, uh, the Lufthansa ladies uh, uh, couldn't do this. Uh, they, they did not want to have this, and via the union, they wanted to assert the fact that the skylights would be uh, would be covered by a 1.5 film. It would have been dark, but it wouldn't have had any glare, but the lights would have had to be on all the time. So now we're, we're, we're lucky. We don't really um, work well together with the Swiss or the Tyrolean people, but he's, this uh, the, the MD is uh, Swiss and uh, and we said, okay, the airport is not turning. And as we know, the light is moving here, where I show you now. Then uh, and at that one point, the screen has to close uh, the roof, but not everywhere. So all screens are, are controlled individually and it works fully automatically that when the sun shines, only where you don't need it, where it's disturbing you, uh, it is uh, shielded, so that's why it's, you get a sunny impression uh, all day long. So, and it's only uh, closed uh, for the daylight uh, punctually. So should you always be at the Hamburg airport? And uh, uh, no, and don't call the house technology if you see those uh, the, the covers moving. But if the sky is covered, everything is open for the light. Also the Salzburg project, uh, so if we uh, carried out a daylight analysis first because you walk around at the bottom and daylight comes in. And uh, if it's for, for the railways, you always have to have the same amount of light. And because uh, it's, it's uh, pretty crazy because you have the daylight uh, shares all day long. So we have models, we, we tried out different floors. Uh, you can try out the sky, so so you have a soft transition to the daylight there, but in reality, it looks like that. So uh, such a model brings me close to the result. I can't put the model here in front of you, but believe me, it works. That's the model, and that's the reality. So a church. Ideally, uh, we uh, participated in the competition right from the beginning on. Can this wall reflect enough daylight to light the entire interior of the church? And that's difficult to calculate because it's not only about percentages there, but we tried out and tested this in models, and when we uh, it was ready, we knew it was what it was going to look like, and that was the result that you just saw. Uh, and with the sun, that, that wasn't us, and, and the architect had the idea to put a, a cross on the back wall. That wasn't from us. So uh, and you needed also there uh, the connection to daylight, also this Deichtor Halle, that's the, 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 the biggest uh, hall in Europe for temporary art. The daylight was there in part, you had to use the right glasses, the neutral in color, and uh, uh, such exhibitions do not take place only during the day, but you, did, you need lighting that uh, lights these walls uh, soft, in a soft way, and you will never see a difference in Hamburg where does daylight end and where does artificial light begin? Light should just be there and you just concentrate on the art and it's completely, it uh, doesn't really matter whether you have this light or this light. Sun in, no, no, sun in, in shopping centers, I know this from Dusseldorf. They don't like this. And it's important for the atmosphere. And with the builder owner here, we could do so. And we agreed that every shop did not have more one hour sunshine. Otherwise, the ice would be melting or the chocolate would be melting. You could have sun, but you don't need sun all the time to connect to the outside. 
so that you have the impression of good weather. So you have uh, skylights uh, that, that were sufficiently uh, wide. Uh, then we, 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 when we put these uh, metal uh, attachments on the top, that reduce the sun rays. So that after exactly one hour, the sun is gone. But we, we created this quality without uh, having that sunlight charge there. Daylight. So electrical light, unfortunately, oh, unfortunately, it's rubbish to say, but unfortunately, it's, it's far too expensive because otherwise you would uh, know how to use the, the in, in, in fa factory halls. All those factory halls are close to the south. Why? But in, in, in Hamburg, uh, the sun has an angle of up to 16 degrees, and Norway even less. And the most intensive the most intense sky, you close, um, you can switch on the artificial light because it's not so expensive. That's complete madness. So we uh, had an alternative, uh, sort of round skylights with the shields that keeps the sun out uh, because it's important here, uh, there mustn't be a sun inside there. In this uh, control room, that's the biggest control room that's in Pulheim, not far away from here. There are five people sitting in front of uh, eight screens. They have the biggest screen wall in Europe, with, uh, which is bigger than 20 meters. Uh, uh, whether they switch off the, the, the light in Norway and uh, if, if they at a power station in Tyrol, it's being decided there and it's a highly concentrated work. And with the skylight, it's markedly better than with side light. So we tried out different things. And then we, we had this so-called this uh, group solution. Uh, so nobody is allowed to fly across. So we don't have any sunlight entering. So we take a look from the north. In uh, uh, practice, uh, it doesn't look so nice. So the, the shafts were higher and the sh shades didn't have to be so. But you have a quality of light inside uh, that you cannot achieve with any other lighting system. With the skylights, you have the daylight from above. So you have perfect light on all workplaces and the side windows. And you don't see this only has a uh, translucence of 10%. You need the window to look out, but you have the light for your work from above, which is much better. And uh, that w was shown also in your research in uh, Norway. So, uh, Chernobyl and Exxon Valdez, the Popal, all happened at night because we thought they, they need so much light for reading the rest. It uh, doesn't really matter. Perhaps there's a connection there. That is the reality. And, uh, it's a bit warmer at night, and that's the model. Uh, I think we have to come very close to reality with our models. So what we have to do... Uh, no, that wasn't me. No, no. So, so new work. Uh, that's what, what the architects get today. They get an area. They have to chill, they have to perform, they have to huddle, they have to rise and everything. Of course, this is called that, that the rooms are getting ever deeper and, and the, the times have gone where you had uh, outside uh, workplace or uh, workstations. So we have such an old building there which uh, did energy refurbishment that was building from the 50s. They got uh, a platinum award, the highest award. They got, and the facade and it has a, a transmission of daylight of 25%. And 25%, that's really bloody mad, bloody, bloody bad. Uh, at least you've got 80 or 78% with the top three for glazing, and they've got 25%. When we asked, uh, well, where, where is this in, in your energy lead that you let less daylight in? You need more artificial light. That's not complicated, isn't it? And where do we have this extra wattage? And they said we do not have this column for the. So we, uh, we have uh, an award in, in platinum. You can bake, you can bake diamonds or whatever. You could, you don't worry about that. You can do without this even being, but this is American lead. Uh, just that you, you can get rid of it. It's, it's uh, terrible. So you have a look, you can look all around inside. 
Und so sieht es dann and that's what it looks like. Uh, daylight up to 1,70 meter, 70, and after that, no daylight anymore. But you need, you need the, the 250 lux in your eyes, not for reading, but for your eye to, 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 to keep up this rhythm that my colleague mentioned. So we need light from these areas and surfaces and a lot of light. And so you get this atmospheric character. Uh, so the, the, the downlight brings the sunshine in and that's what it looks in reality. And so of course that costs more energy on the land. We have a lot, a lot of lighting with uh, uh, what it, different wattages, but that's the only chance for the guy or girl, woman sitting on the left has the same work conditions than the person sitting on the right. For the times uh, where they sit all the outside, around the outside, and they only have toilets and meeting rooms in the middle, those, those times have gone. But proper planning I can only do when I know daylight impact there. Big areas and uh, everybody wants to work together with others. No suspended ceiling, uh, storage concept, that the cables are running in these uh, profiles, and they have the pro possibility to create the same conditions in over the in complete interior, and it is important to analyze the daylight before, and so I know what to do. I'm still doing well for time, yes. Unilever, the same. So we react to the fact, when we say that this artificial solution does the same thing, is wrong from the onset. So we have zones and on the ground floor that need more light. The further I rise, I need less light. So I adapt this and I have the same amount of daylight uh, over the day in Hamburg. And I need this, this illuminance for the, lie, uh, for, the, as for the eye receptor. I don't need this at night, but at lunchtime. And it says it's controlled. The light is getting cooler and rises. Uh, and those who sit close to the windows don't have a better situation than those sitting in the middle. So we have uh, similar conditions. Them. Those are the resulting concepts. So we have different uh, equipment here, uh, lighting equipment. So I have similar lighting situations as you have outside. And um, let me talk about the schools now, daylighting in schools. That's, uh, the, 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 that's the, the institute that carried out this uh, study and, and, uh, and uh, from an ergonomy, uh, institute of ergonomy in Berlin. And they concluded that in one sense, what you've heard all right, Daylight is uh, much is significant for the learning success. So what did we do in Germany? We said up to a year ago, the students they have good eyes. It's sufficient that they have 300 lux. As a grown-up, so we have need five. I would need thousand because of my glasses. But nobody thought that children have to be awake. That children have to follow this rhythm. That children perform differently when you have daylight. And others, you, 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 you're tired because you played with your, um, your mom's iPhone the whole night. So it's a normal situation, standard situation. Uh, a school in a built-up area. We analyzed the daylight, and it's not a secret that no architect in the world can uh, create the same daylight conditions with the same um, classrooms, and I have less daylight uh, on the ground floor than further up. So why do I equip this with the same lighting? That's rubbish. So we set up categories where how much light has to be. So the, the first class has uh, simple lightings uh, and the, the, the others have more lighting in three rows. So the children have uh, similar chances to uh, perform well. So what uh, was added here, we had the southern facade where we, we exchanged the three for glass to two, uh, to double glazing. So we have more daylight on this side. So what do we see in the yellow area? 300 lux are completely sufficient because I always have that much daylight. Of course, you, you, you have to talk about the uh, headmaster, headmistress, whether it's a day school or night school. So most of the schools, uh, primary schools are day schools anyway. So we have different weighting, a different distribution, and, so same and that's what the classrooms look like. Well, where you have more daylight, I need fewer lights, and where there's less daylight, I need more. 
that no matter where the children are sitting, they have all uh, similar chances uh, for their learning successes. And um, the school management, they're really enthused about that. And the only ones that are not enthused are the lighting industries and, is the lighting and the electric industry, because for those, it's much better to, to fill everything with lights and to uh, uh, control it down with an expensive program that, that you need lighting that you never needed. Well, you never had to transport the chip from South Korea here to Germany. Uh, that doesn't uh, come into consideration the, the, and uh, according to the, 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 the money you get out of. The more lighting you plan as an architect, the more I will earn anyway. So in the last school, that's a specialist school, a technical school, and uh, then we take a look at this, uh, the, the girl on the le left in the, the blonde hair has the same chance to get the same amount of light vertically to her receptor because she came, she was late or, uh, and she has the same chance that the girl lifting the hand here on the right. And for this, we have to carry out daylight analysis. We have to know what are the capa daylight capabilities of the room and, <coughs> and what can the artificial, artificial light add, but not the other way around uh, that you install artificial light and put in the daylight sensor that controls everything. Now, before we get the, the question on the calculations, so, the, so my university is six kilometers south of this. Is the students in, in the third half term, uh, in and uh, that's so a bachelor there, uh, they, they're studying architecture, interior architecture, and daylight and artificial light planning is a must. And in the fifth, you can choose, and in the master, it is compulsory. And at Dusseldorf, at the Bayern School of Architecture, nobody can leave, who, who knows, without knowing how, uh, leaves who, who know, uh, without knowing how to calculate daylight. Just on, on the right, you had this, uh, this sponsor with a day uh, window, uh, with the roof windows. So we have a quite a sufficiently well functioning program that you can download for free and which enables you to carry out a sensible and reasonable daylight analysis. So you know how much light do I have and what else do I need in terms of artificial light. And, and that it has to be simple that we think about at first what do we need, where is it required, and only as many systems, aluminum chips, LEDs and uh, systems uh, as they need. And a lot of people will say you uh, can do everything with LEDs. Uh, and uh, on, on the radio, I heard everything had to be uh, uh, on LEDs because a feeling is 100 watts LEDs are only 10 watts, but LEDs on their own don't provide a solution for the problem. We have to take share, take care of our, our resources, our natural resources, analyze what works, and only the rest I can fill with artificial light, but with a quality that reminds me of the nice weather daylight. And so if you do this in such a way, do I, do I don't know where I am, we all have the same conditions. And, because, as I said, we did not develop as a mankind inside. In most time in, in evolution, we were outside and on the pre 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 predecessor generations when they walked around the fields for three hours. They didn't have any receptor problems. We have to realize this, and that is the basis. And the ba daylight is everything. If not, uh, everything is rubbish. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Anders, for this exciting insight. Uh, uh, let's see if there are any questions from the public. Well, they're all, they're all finished. I finished them all. Well, uh, so what I had a qu have a question. Um, so as to, to, to be a, a climate neutral. We, we, we want to refurbish existing buildings. And how can you do, do daylight planning there? It's very complex anyway. But if we have an existing building that we have to refurbish, 
Well, what do you do? Well, there is the example, uh, you know, also take, take double glazing out, three panes in, uh, have bigger profiles, and, and, and you get the insulation on the outside. And the uh, Rosenheim Technical University uh, taking research that uh, without uh, such a refurbishment, throw away 25% of the daylight. So I have 25% less daylight inside. Just imagine. So the, the insulation, when you touch it, and uh, when you and when you take a look at the window profiles, uh, that, that's where you could save. And uh, so idiotic things are being done. And uh, of course, the, the, the direction of the building is different. And I know there's the daylight opening or daylight is coming from there uh, because buildings uh, are not around known in uh, and, and, and green areas. Just take a look at the layout and think what, what the, what's the result if I do a sort of a slant um, edge, uh, I, I will have better daylight situations. So very simple things that I can do. And of course, that's what uh, where your approach has to start. But that you also choose good glass. But every every cent is worthwhile. You have a triple glazing, uh, that's 140 by 240, sufficiently big. Uh, triple glazing with 78 uh, percent daylight transmission. And, and our old uncoated double glazing had 80 percent. So that you take a look at that and you try out the glass. We have a, we have a private customer, we, we, they, they built in silt, uh, and they, they were, she, was, she was really unhappy because she had big, because all the customers want big windows. I was sitting in an aquarium, uh, quadruple glazing. Coated, coated, and coated when if you have a big window like that, that is a fact. And we changed this to slightly smaller, and uh, where she now has a lift uh, where the North Sea looks like the North Sea and grass looks like grass. And yeah, reasonable, you have to, uh, to uh, approach this reasonably and the uh, lighting qualities. Yeah. So rather have a smaller window and you have the transmission via the glass quality. Uh, it's, it's no use to have a big glass front that has been insulated uh, 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 as you can, uh, but that's good for the industry. Uh, but this is an artificial world inside, so you take a look, an overall approach, not only the energy balance, uh, brightness and illuminance, light color, and uh, the, how uh, the uh, uh, people inside react. Daylight first, and I think that's a it's a great uh, it's a great conclusion for this presentation. Thank you very much, and I think we can get on with our third um, presentation. And it come uh, from Lars Courage. Thank you again, Professor Andres. Can you understand me okay? Yeah, Mike is on. Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah. I jump sideways so I can see what I'm going to show. Um, as we're sitting here together, I think we are lucky because in 10 years from now, Elastic will be gone and the windows will be gone in 10 years too. So in this tree, exhibiting in these wonderful big halls, we'll have to find a new task because we're running out of glass. You might think, uh, who said this nonsense? Are we going to live in the dark soon? You may answer this with a clear yes. And I'm going to try to explain that this will not be the case. Uh, amongst the speakers, we agree to avoid uh, redundant information. So in part, my presentation will also follow on from the previous uh, presentation. Why my question, will windows be gone? Well, um, if we consider that the artificial light industry will continue to develop, then this 400 nanometer blue light uh, cannot be created by 
hear the illumination industry as soon as they're capable of covering this light spectrum, this natural uh, spectrum. Uh, now it can go up again. It's going to be very dangerous because then you can sit in a closed box at home without any windows and uh, you click on, I want to be on the Maldives. You click on your cell phone and you're on the Maldives and you get uh, Maldives light or in Tyrol or in Egypt or wherever you want to be. As soon as the artificial light manufacturers um, uh, approach natural light or overtake it, uh, it's going to be difficult. My name is Lars Kourash, and together with my wife, we actually uh, operate an architectural office in Apeldoorn in uh, Holland. And uh, I love to sketch uh, often and quickly. Uh, since we said from the outset that uh, we want to talk to our customers based on paper and sketches, because what you try is to jot down the customer's ideas on paper, and once you've done this, you can actually jump over to your computer. But as soon as you start uh, working with your computer, you can work with glass, without glass. Our office uh, works a lot with daylight. Uh, this is my passion, really, whether it's uh, residential homes, whether it's industrial buildings. Makes a difference. One thing is always important to us. We build from the inside to the outside because we consider that the human being stands in the middle of the room and wants to see light. So how do I uh, enjoy a season? What is the light light in the morning and summer and winter? So there's a constant change going on. As architects, um, uh, um, it, this means that we design with light and uh, only close the outside by ceilings or by walls. What I do not want to talk about our office today, but about Dutch daylight. Um, it's in some time in the golden era, we used to have uh, famous painters who painted wonderful landscapes, but also a specific light. Dutch light is different than German light, Austrian, French, Spanish light. And the reason is because we actually um, draw in a lot of water. And as soon the sun hits this and is reflected, the sky is colored completely differently. In Dutch and uh, uh, English, we have films, and they describe the power of daylight. And once you've come to understand this, um, um, we said 15 years ago, well, let us try to capture this Dutch light in our Dutch buildings. Uh, let's approach it not by aesthetics, by statics, but just by the quality of daylight in the environment we're living in, living in, sleeping in, working in. And this is why we actually established the Dutch Daylight Foundation. And our motto is we promote the optimal use of daylight in the built environment. And this is why I want to take you along and explain what we do as a Stichting, as a foundation, and how we've challenged architects over the past few years um, to show how have architects and daylight engineers uh, introduced light into buildings and to use this as an example for young architects, for the young generation of uh, light planners, for uh, local authorities for building specifiers. On our website uh, of the Dutch Daylight Foundation, we present the Dutch Daylight Award every two years. So uh, with constantly changing jury members, we assess new projects emerging and uh, uh, we uh, to show architects and local authorities um, how uh, easy it is to work with daylight. We have written a manual with normal uh, slang, regular images to explain how can simplify daylight technology in such a manner that it is uh, understood without being informed or having to learn a building code or a directive or a regulation. Um, 
The website, we, we cover various topics, uh, architecture, we um, convey knowledge, and uh, we also take them along to take a look at old buildings. It's stupid to just look at the new architecture. You can also see it in hindsight, look at the projects of a country where light uh, was really well organized, implemented well. So we take make excursions, we take trips, we bring uh, uh, architecture possibilities to the people and create an understanding for why light is so incredibly important. Apart from the experience, we also have a number of tools. We've developed seven tools. So when you actually um, match a building with these seven tools, then as a planner, you, you know immediately how is good daylight planning possible or is the building that I want to build, um, uh, does it offer the possibility for uh, introducing high quality? Uh, what is so important for us and what we uh, see too often go wrong is that uh, the significance of good light in buildings is an unknown factor for many decision makers. So we talked about melatonin and serotonin, how important this is, um, what it does to our health. That go this go back goes back to the twenties, where children were exposed to light, and um, uh, because people found that they grow faster. Uh, let me skip a few things. Um, here. Uh, 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 daylight was always associated with lux and, and, and the quality of light. Um, uh, uh, daylight could not be uh, uh, beaten by artificial light. The minute that artificial light really outperforms daylight uh, um, uh, is going to be a difficult one. But so far, it cannot be outperformed. These are examples from the book showing um, practical examples to demonstrate how easy it is uh, to decide, oh, beautiful surroundings, great nice uh, environment, but as soon as you enter the building, the walls appear, the v vistas close up, and we have windows. And whether the window is small or vertical or horizontal, this has a lot to do with the way we perceive light and how our well-being works in, in the buildings we, we work in. As soon as I'm in, in a building, just with a horizontal light slit, um, I I can only see a, a, a section. Uh, is it raining, blue and gray? Is it in the morning or the, in the evening? Because we only see a small section. Everything is the same. If we have a horizontal window, whether we can see the street, you can see people walking there. It's raining, it's not raining. You can see the air. You can see a blue sky or gray sky. You can see whether it's day or night. Sun is coming and, and it disappearing again. So the way architects organize Organize windows. Um, the way they organize windows says a lot about uh, how people work and live. Now a trick, and uh, I'll. Um, in the old classics, this is the Pantheon in Rome, when you've been there, you enter it and you're really nailed to the ground because the light hits you in a way that that is unfamiliar to you. It is so powerful when it hits you coming down. There's just a small hole, but it's penetrated impressively. And then once you want to have this effect uh, introduced in new office buildings, then um, the quality of the Pantheon is forgotten, and we again work with small windows again. So um, uh, small windows, more artificial light, um, five uh, meters further ahead, even more artificial light because there's less natural light. 
You can calculate this, but we try to reach the emotional quality of light, because when we can cap capture light and this quality, then it light does something to it. What we increasingly see is that where cities become denser and denser, I mean, this is easy to, to understand when you look at New York, but the same happens in Germany, because uh, soil is expensive, plots are expensive, so the architecture is more and more covered. And the, lo the lower the valleys, the less daylight is visible. So if architects and planners do not include daylight from step one, um, uh, then uh, they are prone to make mistakes. Uh, like the other two speakers said it, um, so it is inevitable to understand why we have to introduce daylight. This can be huge windows. Uh, bottom left, uh, you've got the Dijkel School in Amsterdam that was mentioned. The whole facade could be opened up. Our office building is glazed on three sides. Yes, we can actually uh, blacken it out. But since we've been working in this office, uh, after lunch, we're no longer tired. Uh, the disease rates, the absenteeism, absenteeism has uh, come down. The fun factor has gone up because we're more awake. And once you've understood this message, you could also uh, design this hospital for uh, kids suffering from cancer. Just imagine when children are brought from their rooms to the OR and they're pushed through a dark tunnel without any daylight. This is shit. Uh, but when you pass a, a room with daylight, then this is better for the kid. But when you then uh, toy with colors, um, we actually use colors that make you act or soothing colors. And uh, you can bring together light, colors, and emotions. This was also touched upon. Um, so important and so easy to understand. There is a blue light factor and a right uh, factor light. If we want to take a stroll in the morning, we want to see the rising sun because it is its blue factor. But unfortunately, in the designs, this is hardly ever reflected. These are two very simple tricks. Knowing consciously that uh, daylight when you have a four square meter glass facade, and I only go uh, for one square meter of glass in the roof, then I have the same value. The effect is exactly the same. A huge facade brings the light inwards, but it actually tapers towards the end. If I don't have the facade, and instead I do a skylight, which is only a quarter of the sides, then I have a far better uniform light inside. On the right-hand side, this is the project that uh, awarded us a prize. We build a home without windows, and yet more than sufficient daylight. This book, as I mentioned before, features these uh, seven guidelines, but you may wonder what is the the essence, why or what, this golden circle, why do we work with light and how do we work with light and how do we implement it? Um, do we build in, um, in the great outdoors? Do we work, uh, build in the city? Do we build commercial residential? houses. This is always important. Then contact with the out, outer world is important. The effect from inside to the uh, outside, the new M code reflects this. The point is not to only have light inside, but we also have to be able to establish a contact with the outer world, the outside world. So if the window is at the very top and we can only see the skies, uh, this is no longer admitted. So. There must be a contact established. Then the way this light is introduced, uh, um, the balance between natural daylight and artificial light. And Dutch daylight uh, was established because the artificial lighting manufacturers made so much uh, progress that we said we need to have this counter development. Now we um, work, we cooperate. For the jury members, we said, where does daylight end? and where does artificial light take over at the end of the day? 
and the connection between the two. So this is the golden circle story because these seven elements, you can toy around with them as a developer, as an owner, as, as a, a building user or architect, you can toy around with this. Once I've understood the essence, then I can focus on this aspect of uh, connection with the outside uh, uh, or the essence. I've understood the essence. I need uh, a certain uh, brightness level for the school. And to understand this, I have now brought along all of the award-winning projects of the Dutch Daylight Award. So this is really the climax. Um, this is where the independent jury said, this is buildings with outstanding achievements. This was the first winner of the Dutch Daylight Award. This is my old uh, working place. An old colleague of mine has just arrived. Welcome. Um, cool here. The, the tower was an, an old tower dating back to the 70s, completely refurbished, uh, glazed facade. But the top of the facade uh, are coated uh, with films. This is a mesh um, that light can go through. So um, in the bottom area, you can see how the light from the top is used to obtain a good quality without constantly having to work with uh, artificial light. This is like a recurring theme for us. What we found out in all of these projects is that steel structures are often the solution to obtain a non-load bearing structures because we can skip walls and uh, allowing us to actually see from the inside to the outside. So we can actually create a far deeper contact between the inside and the outside than with closed walls, because these are uh, uh, load-bearing walls. A prison. A prison is usually closed with very small windows and surrounded by thick walls. This is a prison in Holland. And lots of light enters because they found as soon as the prisoners in prison don't get any daylight, the disease levels explode and they're difficult to manage. They don't want to cooperate. And the light introduced helped to uh, increase the, the prisoner's ability to cooperate. It's not a school, or say rather it's a permanent school, but you can see the top light is different and the quality is different. They're not entering into a dark cave. They're constantly in touch with the outside. And for somebody um, sitting well, in a prison, contacts with the, with the outdoors are important, aren't they? This is a little home in the city center. The facade changed. You walk past it. It's a home that you could find anywhere in uh, Germany or in, in, in the Netherlands. Instead of big windows in the facade, we said, uh, uh, let's actually get the uh, light in from the uh, sky through a skylight. The bathroom, for instance, or oh, the uh, corridors, the playroom. So the light enters through the roof. And then we. It was our term. We had 300,000 euros, including a value added tax, made available to buy a plot and build a home. This is nothing. This is nothing, even for Holland. And then somebody said the neighbor is really at a meter's distance. So I live here. This is my facade. In the morning, I open the window, and one meter next to me is my neighbor, or a closed wall. You can imagine. Uh, it is so uh, shitty when you actually include windows in the side walls. And we said, we won't include any uh, walls. In the kitchen, yes, but the rest is, is closed. Only on the left Side, uh, we work with polycarbonate, so we have a translucent wall, but we worked with standard roof lights uh, manufactured by Velux to bring the light in through the roof and the ceiling. And before we finished the project, uh, 
um, we used a moonlit night. It was a dream. The light fell down nine meters to the floor, and we could see everything. This is daylight without any artificial light. By just getting the light in through the roof, and this is what we do more and more often now since this project. You can also close a facade. Uh, um, looks closed, like a museum, but from the out inside, it is so bright. And whether it's beautiful or not beautiful, somebody uh, uh, referred to the shed roof. Um, uh, you have to turn around to get uh, light from above. But this is emotionally superb, this room. You can do a lot here. If uh, the uh, light enters, uh, um, filtered, it's not 100% uh, 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 lit, nor is it 100% uh, um, dark. This is by the Project 1, Rotterdam uh, Rail Station, Main Railway Station. Yeah, you might say glass facade, no. In the uh, uh, roof, there are slits, and when the customer enters, uh, uh, he can really see the light enter. And uh, if there's a little moisture in the air, you uh, enter it, um, the light, and the sun turns around with, with it. This is the main hall to the left, and as soon as you go down to the platforms, you enter another area. Um, people are protected against the weather, and we use the uh, southern side to actually um, install solar systems and uh, gain energy. Again, small homes. We're always below 1,000 square meters or above uh, 1,000 square meters. This is a very small home in Zirikzi. Too small. You would almost walk past it without noticing it, but only because uh, they actually work with two patios to reorganize the light. The light actually enters uh, all the way down to the lowest level. And where you couldn't open the wall, we used frosted glass. Is it now the non plus ultra? This is now the non plus ultra, um, but it's a low cost solution and it's very effective because the point here was not to have the maximum technology used, but we wanted to come with good solutions and be realistic with our feet on the ground. Then the uh, High Court in The Hague, another high st uh, nice story, a very long wall, and the judges usually sit in a dark room with lots of artificial light from early in the morning to late at night. What you see here is the lower area where the daylight enters, but it is protected against overheating because there are uh, trees standing in front. So there's no overheating. When you enter the building, you can see that the inner courtyards uh, that the judges step out onto um, uh, are filled with light through uh, roof lights again. And the wall uh, against uh, which the judges are really passing their sentences are actually backlit. So lots of daylight entering the courtrooms. 2018, in the city center of Delft, uh, there are inner yards, so it's the back side of homes, and there are uh, little gaps, green, really nice, but to build a home surrounded by windows, impossible. Be smart about it and say, uh, I use three closed walls and I just use one glazed wall. As you can see, this is not Photoshop. This is uh, uh, realistic. From left and right, there's scrap standing. But in the little garden that we've created, uh, they actually drag in the light through the roof. 
and it works so well. When you enter this, uh, as it was just said, we can show you images, but you have to enter such a building to see what light does to such rooms, and then you can only feel the quality of daylight. You just showed an image of uh, this uh, a uh, light protection system. Um, you see, in Portland, and did this, they established a museum um, with lots of artworks that are very susceptible to natural daylight. And this is why they said, we will have a huge cantilever, but it, it's going to be boxes, uh, inclined or cut off tubes, and they get the light indirectly into the room at times, uh, right onto the artwork. But wherever you have susceptible building uh, paintings, there is a cloth stretched across, and then the light is reflected to the floor. And uh, the uh, uh, room is really flooded with light, but the light enters through the roof. And when you stand there, you would even see when there are clouds passing over the roof. And in areas with paintings, they've uh, created daylight with artificial light to have the same uniform level of brightness or luminance level. But it was a winner, this project. Now, um, it's all about uh, well-being when we talk about daylight. And what is getting more and more important today is not only the well-being of, of human beings, but also of uh, animals, uh, uh, pigs, poultry, cows uh, to be slaughtered. So uh, the question is always, should they feel great um, uh, until they're being slaughtered? This, uh, they received a recognition because they brought in daylight through the poultry and their hens are so special and the meat is of a better quality. It costs nothing, just daylight and thinking beforehand on the part of light planners and architects. And even for a simple a hen shed, you can do something. Uh, the last two projects. Uh, my colleague Merck said on the board uh, to submit this project. Was he a winner? No, because the competition was so strong. But um, this is uh, near uh, The Hague, and he wanted, this professor wanted to have a home um, in, in, a, in an area that it was supposed to build on. So to get the balance, he wanted to be in touch with the outdoors. So almost 70 degrees. Uh, um, there is a constantly changing landscape because uh, you see everything, whether they're ducks swimming on the pond or people walking. Th th this picture of the landscape was always different. But he said, a window alone is not good enough. Oh, the first yellow card. And he said, okay, we will also do it where we have less light. We'll bring in the light, so in the kitchen. But this also means in the staircase where the light actually shines down to the lower corridor. Last project. This is from Amsterdam, old and new, next to it. This is the old metro station, uh, legs left top. Um, this is what it used to be, and this is what it looks now. We not only opened the facade, but we also thought about holes in the roof and to use the ductility of materials on the wall. So I'm bringing in the light, but it does not reflect from concrete. So it needs a shiny tiling. So this was a, a challenge for the architects to not only think in terms of light and uh, structural uh, aesthetics, but also surface materials. Now it is a fresh open room. And the last thing, as a take home message, we have the new EN code. We have to have access of daylight and uh, create visual access between the indoors and the outdoors. But the question is, simple example, there is this limit between this border between Germany and Holland. 
You said we're going to change over to gas now. Uh, forget about the Ukraine war. You said we want to heat with gas rather than coal. And Holland says we have to get away from gas. This is one Europe, but this involves a lot of effort, speed, PFAS, uh, and nitrogen. We had these problems. Now it's starting Germany as well. What I'm trying to say is that we now have bio-based building in, in, in Holland using natural materials, which is good, in, in, in basically no concrete, no uh, energy wasting building modes. But when I now build big walls with straw and make windows smaller, then this not only affects energy, but it also affects the uh, quality of, of well-being being of humans because there is less uh, natural light. So designing is one thing, but the awareness of what the code does with us is another thing. The restrictions. So don't lose sight of this. So that in 10 years from now, so you're still standing here, there will be another glass deck and that we're not actually uh, presenting at an artificial lighting trade fair. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't have an ear. I can't hear you. Yeah, I'll get one quickly. Well, last courage. Thank you very much for the insights and these encouraging words. I do hope that we will have glass and need windows in 10 years from now. I found it uh, quite uh, um, exciting how you use Dutch daylight, daylight to bring lighting, to, to make lighting more graspable for planners, for investors, for people who live in those houses. What can window makers contribute to the daylight topic. What's tremendously important uh, uh, um, is that the window making industry, the fenestration industry, uh, often, uh, often doesn't sell daylight, but they sell products. They sell windows uh, X, Y, Z. Uh, or um, with the U value of. It's not that architects know the code, but that the industry understands that it sells daylight. And as soon as this toggle switch is turned, um, you will see how sales are skyrocketing because they sell the why rather than the what. Anybody can sell what's, but the why is key. And if you explain it properly, sales go up. And it's more fun. Yes, I do hope so. Any questions for Mr. Courage uh, from the audience? Questions, comments? Then I would like to thank you for these wonderful insights into the Dutch scene and uh, would like to ask Nelly Filippona to join me on stage. You heard me? Okay. Because I don't have the, the real, the, the, the good address, so it's a reason why I have to, to have these kind of tools. Um, first, I had, a, I had a choice, a hard choice to do, and I have finally chosen to speak English, but my Damen und Herren, guten Tag. Uh, first, thank you to invite me to uh, present how France uh, is trying to give natural light 
an important place in our national requirement regulations. I have written a um, certain number of points on my paper, but I am afraid when I begin to work to, to speak on this matter, I perhaps will have a red paper. <laughs> oh, okay, I have to put, yes, I found. You have seen wonderful pictures of buildings, of landscapes, but now, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, it's time for regulations, for legis legislations, but always with the aim to create these beautiful uh, buildings with natural light. And I will explain how to promote uh, natural light in our uh, regulations. We have used the EN 17037 as a basis. Now, I have to think about this. Yes. Um, first, a brief reminder uh, of the main points of this norm. We need it, and the norm um, describes very well and takes into account the bio biophysiological needs uh, related to natural uh, light, which is translated precisely uh, enough to define a method. And we need it, because since years, we wanted to do it, but we had nothing, nothing to to use a method or for uh, the natural life. Therefore, we, the norm also provides us um, a standardization uh, method and levels with a list of indicators and sets minimum and medium and high level of, uh, for these indicators to make buildings more comfortable and for the occupant with the natural light. And because we want to speak for friends, for of friends, I think I must first describe the environment we have with our uh, um, legislations and with our regulations in front for these recent years. We perhaps like uh, thermal regulation because since uh, 1974, 1974 to 2021, we had had six thermal, six different uh, thermal regulations. The last one, what we call the ART um, 2012. Was the it was the regulation um, that introduced a minimum glazed area toward habitable um, area in residential buildings, only in residential buildings. Before the before the, the meeting, we discussed together, and you, I think you said uh, you were afraid about uh, the fact that we have more and more little windows. And it was our tool to avoid that, to have a minimum uh, ratio of um, glazed surfaces. Oh yeah, you can see on on the slides um, that we work with a so-called one-six rule, one-six Y, because we. It's, it's mandatory now uh, to use this one six rule to put at least one six uh, surface of glazed, glazed surface in uh, uh, residential buildings regarding the habitable surface of the building. So um, uh, we had a long discussion before the meeting because we discussed also on simple, I think you asked the question of how is it possible to do something um, something simple. 
And I think this rule is very simple, you know? Because you take only one sixth of the uh, surface, uh, orbitable surface. And I, I think I can now say that those in, in France involved in construction are now really uh, used to taking into account this one sixth rule. <laughs> As this re uh, regulation was a thermal regulation at the in at the for the ATAR RT uh, 2012, we uh, push arguments where uh, it was only linked with uh, thermal regulation and, uh, and it, it was to benefit from free solar energy and also natural light uh, to avoid the use of artificial light, but only energy arguments. Yeah, you can see on the slide that we had also um, think about exceptions because sometimes even this simple uh, regulation is not so easy. So it's a reason why you, you see at the end of the slide that we uh, provide some for some ex uh, exception to ensure that it remains very simple. Um, I'm lost with my paper, no problem. Ah. But from January 22, um, we have now a new thermal regulation. A new, a new regulation, but it's not. It's not a thermal regulation. It's a, a general, a, a global uh, regulation uh, with the problem of uh, carbon, with summer comfort, and uh, a step forward, we have for two years we had a new law, a new legislation, and it asked us to um, take into account that it's not possible anymore to have a regulation with uh, requirement of means, but only require result requirement. And it was a, a really l um, hard discussion. Is the rule, one six rule, a result requirement or requirement of means? And the problem is it's a law. Huh? This, uh, for two years, it, was, it is really a law. So we have to uh, be uh, in la online with this law. And we think uh, it's not a requirement of mean because uh, you have it's a general uh, requirement and after that you are uh, uh, allowed to put two windows on a wall or perhaps a larger one on so it's really more a result requirement but we were not really sure that it was um, the same analysis for all people in France and especially for our ministry. Among the um, new criteria in this uh, regulation, uh, I'm focusing uh, a while on uh, summer comfort. Because as you can see on the slide, the new uh, regulation, the RE 2020, E is for environment, um, uh, introduce the DH. The DH it means degree hours. Uh, it's uh, degree hours of discomfort if it's too hot in the building. And uh, you can see that no, it's not written. You have two um, two levels with this DH. A minimum and a high level. You have two possibilities. If you uh, if you are uh, below the minimum, the the low uh, level, it's okay. If you are between the two levels, you have to put the uh, cooling needs in the energy consumption indicators and in the bioclimatic needs indicator. So it's harder. 
to, to respect um, the requirement of the um, RE 2020. Okay? So it's, it's really Im uh, important because it's a, a big step with the summer comfort requirement. And in fact, when, you, when we made some simulations before uh, this uh, regula uh, new regulation come uh, before January 2022, um, we noticed that we were, ma in the majority of cases, we were between the low and the um, high level. So it means with we have to make calculation with the kilo cooling needs integrated in these two indicators. So it was harder to, to reach the uh, level required by the regulation. So with all these new criteria, with all the um, problem with result requirement and, and the, intro the fact that RE 2022, 2020, excuse me, 2020 introduced also the uh, carbon indicator. Uh, we were afraid that we could have um, a reduction of glass surface because we, we thought that perhaps the rule, the 1 6 rule, could disappear. Could disappear. Because it's already so complicated to, to reach the requirement of this new regulation that perhaps it's easier to put one uh, requirement away. So I think for, for us, France uh, had really a good idea with this new rule, this 1 6 rule. And really, uh, we said we have to fight. Uh, to maintain this one six rule, even when he, there is new indicators, even if we are obliged to um, prove that it's result requirement. So uh, to do that, UEFME and uh, all the actors of glazing uh, industry were really mobilized and to maintain the simple and efficient rule that is the uh, one six rule. Ah, I forget always to put <laughs> that. So um, we had not a lot of solution to do that. We tried with two solutions, two steps. The first is to 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 explain what it was very 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 important to maintain the 1-6 rule. I must say that because other European countries uh, asked a lot of questions uh, about the new 1-6 rule, it was an argument for us. We could say to our uh, authorities, but it's not, it could be really um, strange that France said, no, it's not uh, useful anymore. And in the same time, other European countries ask because they seem, it seems that it's very interesting. So it was the first argument because France is really in Europe and it was very important for them. But then we had uh, we reminded authorities all the real benefits uh, of having at least one sixth of clay surface in terms of energy but also in terms of well-being. And we ask really um, for the maintenance of the 1-6 rule. And when we see the beautiful picture, the amazing picture you, uh, you shown uh, just before, I think we need no words to explain what I said. But we thought that it was not enough. It was not, not enough because some actors were not um, very, um, uh, didn't agree with us because it was perhaps for them uh, more simple to, uh, more 
it was too complicated to integrate a large part of uh, Windows, or perhaps it was for them too expensive, because in fact there is a question of price, you know, in the building. So it's a reason why we try to pr to promote the EN uh, 17037 because first it was it is a European norm. It's a big argument, you know, for the for our French authorities to say there is there is a European norm. It's not mandatory, but there is a European norm. The second point was, and it was very, very important. Ah, perhaps I have to put, yeah. The <laughs> um, second point was that um, it is, it is uh, uh, better for the new law because, I mean, it's a um, requirement, uh, oh, what I said, um, a uh, requirement of uh, result, well, result requirement. Because in this case, you have indicators, you have very precise indicators, and it's a reason why we can say it's a result requirement if you use it. So, we had first to, man uh, to have the maintenance of the 1 6 rule, but then we have asked to introduce a part, a part of indicators you can find in the EN 17037. What kind of indicators? I mean two indicators, in fact. One on um, the daylight provision and one on the view to outside. At the end, the result was that uh, we ask and we obtain to have the both approach written in the regulation. I must say now, I can say now that we propose that because we thought when we propose the two solution, at the end we will have one perhaps. And at the end we had the two solution because they understood that the one six rule was easier, was more it's clear, it's more simple to use the one six rule, but because we have this law with the result requirement, uh, I mean they have to integrate two result indicators, and I think it's a good. Um, uh, good uh, first step because in France, I don't know in your countries, but in France the EN 17037 is really not well known. And it's a kind of promotion of this norm to put it in, in the regulation because uh, all actors uh, of the construction has to, to read it, <laughs> at least to read it and perhaps to use it. So it's a reason why I think it's a good thing as a first step, but in fact, it's a very good thing that we maintain the one six rule because, in fact, in the large, large, large majority of cases, um, specifiers are using this simple rule to create the building and the and the number and the surf glazed surface area in the in the buildings. Okay, then. could say, okay, it's uh, very nice what you say, but in concrete, what, what, how can we use it? And was, uh, what are the, the result and the calculation for that? And we now present some representation of daylight provision with this kind of rules. We have sim um, simulated some uh, practical case, cases with different ratio uh, of clay surface but in the same room. As you can see, you see first with the buildings, with the pictures, the difference between the first one and um, the second one. And you can see that for the first one, below the 1-6 ratio, 
you you are the, the the building doesn't comply with the regulation and in fact it doesn't complain comply with the regulation but it's not very um very uh ich hab angenehm auf deutsch <laughs> it's not very nice to live in this uh, in this type of uh room it's we have all the feelings that it's uh it's better to live in the second uh, simulation than in the first one. So it's the first um, result, result requirement, it's the first result with the uh, new indicator. Specifiers will take the opportunity to create uh, the building like that, to see with this uh, ratio, is it possible or not, and are we comply with uh, the new indicators. You have two options to to see what kind of um, uh, conception of the building you have to to make to be uh, comply with to comply with uh, um, with uh, regulation. But then, get a new one. Wait. Then you we made other simulations, and it was simulation of different distribution in this case of glazed area with the same ratio in the same place. So only same ratio, same place, but only the, the distribution is changed. And you see that uh, with uh, the same ratio, the same glazed surface, if you uh, split the, the glazed area in two windows, for in two walls, for example, you can reach uh, the requirement only with we uh, only when you play with the, uh, the distribution of the glass area. So I mean that it's a very educational method to show how is how to think about glass area in the design phase of the building is very important. In this case. If you take only <laughs> the, the calculation of the 1 6 rule, you don't see the difference. And it's a reason why I mean that because we have now these two solutions, these two ways of becoming um, comply with the, the requirement, we go further than before. Clearly, we made that because we uh, thought that perhaps the one six rule will disappear. But in fact, after all, I think what we have now is better than that we had before. Okay. Um, this slide is only to remind you, because I've said that at the beginning, but it's the most important thing with our new RE 2020. We are in 2022 and uh, it's 20 the name is 2020. It's the reason why I have to so think about that every time. So the, the, the very big uh, issue for the RE 2020 is that it's a global regulation. And you never have, if you have really to think about that every time because it's very uh, hard to comply with this regulation. You have a lot of indicators, and uh, you can't say, okay, I take that for light and summer comfort and uh, carbon. No, it's always all together. If you take this option for for walls, uh, it, it has an uh, impact on all the indicators. Oh. And uh, it's a reason why, uh, in order to meet all the requirements, all the parameters must be taken into account, including including what's written on the slide, uh, property of the interior surface and the mask of a neighborhood and so on and so on. So it, it play, a g it play uh, it's w it we have then impact on the uh, all other indicator we have in the uh, regulation. And in conclusion, um, what we have in our regulation, in the year 2020, but in fact, 
the new way of this one six rule is clearly the first steps with this um, daylight indicator for a new residential building. Um, this leads to a new way of thinking uh, uh, of um, and show how working uh, early with uh, this indicator is the right way to work to, to, to have more natural light in the building. But now, uh, building designers still need to get used with this new way of thinking. And now, in the future, we want, if we, yeah, so it's a, it's a goal, um, we want to continue for new regulation for commercial building, for example, for new commercial building, but also find a way to to promote natural light in renovation. But we are not ready for that. And uh, yeah, we, th we have to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Filippona, for this wonderful presentation. Complex content, but uh, a very important one. Uh, we saw a lot of beautiful inspirations today that make us think uh, about daylight, that make us want to plan better with daylight. But I think France is really a very good example of how turning things into regulation will actually move the whole nation forward to creating a better building stock in the future. Um, and I, you did this in a way that, to me, maintains a more simple approach that everybody can follow, this one sixth rule, but not being afraid of also integrating much more complex factors. Because daylight planning, as we learned today, is complex and you have to factor in so many different factors. But by evolving in that direction, we actually will end up with healthier buildings. Um, I would like to ask you, I understand France is the first country to, to or one of the first countries to really take on uh, this EN 17037 norm and make it into national regulation. What tips can you give to other, to other nations? What uh, learnings can you share? What motivation you can give to other policymakers to really not give up on this uh, so vital topic for us? Uh, it, it's a hard question, but perhaps, um, perhaps, uh, what, what, uh, as you can see, uh, it's not the rule, um, the global norm that we took. It's uh, uh, an inspiration of the rule, I must say, no? <laughs> and because uh, I, I thought we we speak about that before, um, the AN seventeen. Euro 37 is complicated and uh, I mean for the new buildings in fact we need something global not only for room so it's a reason why as I said um, the one six rule the first uh, first what we had before only the one six rule is very simple but perhaps too simple and to add now the um, some indicators of the EN 17037, it's perhaps a, a better way. And it's this kind of advice is I can perhaps give to another to other countries uh, because we needed uh, two steps. Perhaps you can go directly mm -hmm. to the third step mm -hmm. <laughs> and better than our first uh, two, uh, two first uh, steps. I, I mean, um, it's not perfect what we have. Clearly, it's not perfect. But if we are waiting to have the perfect rule, we do nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's the reason why I'm, I mean, for France, it's important. You know, before, because I'm old enough to know the, the life before <laughs> the one six rule, um, we had, um, in average, around 11, 12 percent uh, of glazed area by buildings residential mm -hmm. and new mm -hmm. and one six it's 17 mm -hmm. 
So we, we see directly the impact of a rule. It's rare no? to, to really um, point out the, the, the direct impact of this rule on the building. It's, a, it's to, go to, to go from 11, 12% to 17%. And I think for the occupants of the buildings, it's much more important than just the number of percentage. Mm -hmm. It's a more comfortable uh, building. Yes, definitely. Um, we saw the results also on the pictures that yeah. you shared with us, uh, what a difference it could make just to have a little bit bigger surface or bit better distribution of uh, glazed areas. It's really impressive. And uh, I understand also you managed to get all the stakeholders in the industry together to really work with policymakers on this topic. So thank you for sharing this uh, example with us. Are there other questions from the public? I understand there is a question from, from one of our viewers. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, I didn't uh, get it. If the um, uh, the one sixth rule or the EN um, 17037 is applied on room level or on apartment level? No, the one sixth rule is n is on the building level. The, uh, the one the EN on the room uh, the yeah on the uh, room level. But uh, one sixth rule is because it's the reason why it's very simple. If you build a new building, you create a new building, that's, it's more simple because you take, it's much more complicated than I said, but uh, you take the, the global uh, surface of the facade and you take one six and you have to uh, place at least one six of the uh, glazed area on the building, on the facade of the building. Okay, there's another question. Thank you very much, very interesting. I think I have many questions, but I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke a, a, a lot <laughs> before the meeting, <laughs> but we can um, speak after. So like, I if I buy a car, I'm very interested in how fast it can go or the, how much fuel it uses, and we talk about it. Is it so in France? I bought an apartment with the new rule. Uh, have they increased value on the market? <laughs> it's a hard, <laughs> it's a hard question also. <laughs> um, first, uh, the new rule. Um, we have the new rule since January this year, so it's <laughs> it's too too new to have really a precise impact of that. And I think. Um, even in six months or one year, it will be hard because, as I say, I think there is a, a large, large majority of uh, specifier architects um, which will continue to use the one six rules. So it's no change uh, with uh, uh, the old one. But now they, uh, they know better the, the indicators we can find in, you can find in the EN 17037. And, and, and we have another pro problem, you know. It's um, uh, the, the, the tools we have to calculate, uh, uh, search the, the name and so. um, the software. <laughs> the software, uh, they have to change also. They have to add, add these indicators and uh, we work with them actually, but it's not really um, made for all software we have on the market. So I think, I think we need more time to really have an impact on economic point of view. Um, but I hope that uh, because we will have so all software with these indicators, because after a while, because we made this kind of presentation, um, they can be interested, and, and then, and then, and then, because they accept to uh, create that room per room, uh, we will have this impact. But I'm not sure that we will have uh, a big impact on the economic point of view, because we have already this one six rule. Perhaps uh, when we speak about um, economic impact of new uh, RE 2020, 
we speak more about carbon in the Cape Cod. Thank you. Other questions? If there are no further questions, then I would like to close this conference with the last few remarks. We have learned from uh, Mr. Hauk that daylight makes us perform better, it makes us happier. Uh, we've seen some striking examples of schools in Norway. Uh, Professor Andres has reminded us that nothing um, will ever, uh, nothing at, as of yet uh, matches the quality of daylight. So daylight is where our starting point in planning new buildings and also renovating old buildings. And only when where daylight cannot reach, we can supplement with, or we should supplement with artificial light. And uh, finally, even if we do not have such sophisticated software models and modeling rooms uh, as uh, some light planners might dispose of, uh, Architect Courage has reminded of us, even looking into the history and um, even you know, with our feet on the ground, we may still find a lot of inspiring examples of how we can plan brighter homes, more healthier buildings for all of us. And finally, I would also like to thank uh, Madame Philippona's inputs on uh, how important it is that our industry keeps in touch and communicates frequently with policymakers in order to make sure uh, we move forward with daylight on the agenda for the glazing industry just as much as for the windows industry. Thank you very much.